what these police officers did was worse than what the criminals did that we were trying to arrest. Around that time, police paralyzed neighborhoods. The cop says to him, I'm going to rape these drug dealers and give you these drugs, and we'll split the profits. I say, if this is real, he was just a drug dealer with a badge. We were investigating armed police officers who were victimizing people on a daily basis. The case just became much more heinous than drug dealing. I started to realize that they were desperate for money. You can hear people cowering and resisting at this obvious abuse of authority. I was terribly scared of them setting me up or killing me. So it was like, I did what I had to do. Over one dozen police officers will soon be facing federal indictments. This was the worst case of police corruption ever. The cops were charged with stealing over $1 million in taxpayer funds. I went from putting handcuffs on people to having handcuffs put on me. In the late 1990s, violent crime was on the decline across the country. But in Baltimore, it climbed to an all-time high and drug addiction was spreading like wildfire across the city. The drug culture was so bad that it inspired a TV series, The Wire. But off screen, real lives were at stake. For a lot of young men in Baltimore back in the 90s, drug dealing was the easiest way to make money. And drug addiction was also commonplace. So the economics and addiction were tied together. We had a term that we would use sometime, and it was called open air drug markets. You could go to certain points in the city, and you would just see literally almost 100 people just gathered around to buy or sell uh, narcotics. The lack of jobs and social services made drug dealing an attractive career option and the Baltimore police force was understaffed and unprepared to keep up with the ever-growing drug epidemic. During the 1990s, the Baltimore Police Department was in a very bad way. The previous commissioners and command staff developed this New York-style uh, policing that just wasn't right for Baltimore. Zero tolerance uh, was actually uh, the policy where you kind of just like locked up everybody. And as a result, that was supposed to uh, reduce crime, I guess. New York apparently have between 35,000 and 50,000 police officers. Baltimore can't operate like that if you only have 3,000 men. So what happened was the patrol force was doing that New York style uh, policing with untrained people, grabbing anybody on the street who was standing still and arresting them. It filled the jails, filled the courts, and nothing was being achieved. The new policy increased the arrest rate and overwhelmed the Baltimore Police Department's resources. Officers were often sent into the streets with little training, which left recruits like Antonio Murray and William King to fend for themselves. Antonio Murray joined in 1992. The first couple of years, we were both assigned to patrol together. The first thing that drew me to him was a sense of humor. We became friends. The bond became really tight. I would consider him my best friend and he would consider me his best friend. I was uh, his best man at his wedding. He was my best in my head. The police culture for the Baltimore Police Department at that time in the 90s, it went to a, a couple radical changes. The war on drugs in Baltimore, it had started to get violent. Back then, there were confrontations between the police and drug dealers and gangs of drug dealers. Antonio Murray, his hand got badly damaged when he got shot at while on duty. I was actually with him the night that he was shot and another individual came up behind, hit Antonio Murray. The gun fell to the ground. It was a struggle over the gun. The one guy grabbed the gun, and uh, he shot Antonio. The healing process for Antonio was tough on him. When he came back to work, he became partners with Will King.
William uh, King, we used to call him the gym tool giant. He barely spoke what I did observe from afar. He was really a good officer. And then Antonio and Will became partners in a uh, plain clothes unit in around the early 2000s. Antonio Murray and William King worked together often. So they would patrol the streets together in the same car. They would go on raids together. They would collect intelligence together. William King was soft-spoken, but he had a real talent for cultivating informants. Quickly, he sort of became somewhat popular in his department in the narcotics squad for being able to collect intelligence that led to drug seizures and raids. Murray was more blunt. He was the one who would probably go around intimidating drug dealers, trying to get information out of them. By early 2004, King and Murray were leading the pack when it came to drug arrests at the Baltimore Police Department. Their aggressive style earned them respect at the station house and made life hell for dealers on the streets of Baltimore. I grew up on a street called Bennett Place. It was in a neighborhood um, referred to as Murphy Homes. It's projects. I mean, thinking now, looking now, looking back, it's like Afghanistan. I mean, it was riddled with drugs and crack and stuff. You know, it was a war zone. You know, I would see a lot of the younger guys my age making money, you know. So one day, my friend, he told me, you know, that they would give me um, a pack of drugs. He said, you get $50 every time you sell one of those packages. So the next day, I sat over there on the intersection of four streets, and I put the drugs in my pocket, and I kept saying to myself, I'm going to jail. I'm going to jail. I sat there, and it seems like forever, which was probably about like 45 seconds. You know, I'm waiting for somebody to come buy this stuff, and then um, the next thing I know, it was a wave. 45 minutes later, you know, I was a couple hundred bucks richer, which was more money than I had ever seen. I mean, it could have been a million dollars to me. I was addicted to selling drugs from that day on. And I was about 12 years old at that time. I found out really quick, you gotta watch every place you walk because around that time, police terrorized neighborhoods. Over the next four years, Davon dropped out of school, grew his business, and made a name for himself on the street. But at 16, he came face to face with a threat more dangerous than anything he'd experienced in the back alleys of Baltimore. So in the summer of 2004, I'm 16 years old, I was going about my normal day, you know, selling my drugs, and I see this car pull up. As soon as I saw the doors open, I noticed it was the cops. You know, they're pretty famous, you know, King and Murray. You know, I got a little nervous because I'm like, you know, these guys, you know, they always got some shit up their sleeve, some magic way that they use to kind of, you know, get you. They walked up to me, you know, told me my ex, me not got anything on me. They started searching me and made me take everything out of my pockets. They checked my shoes. But, I mean, I was feeling a little cocky because you know, I know I didn't have any drugs. I gave them the 52, like, if you got anything to charge me, you know, and of course they, you know, just kind of gave me a look and sent me on my way. After that meeting, I discovered that King slipped his card into my pocket and I had no reason why. The hell did this guy put this card in my pocket? And then I remember seeing William King more frequently. You know, he would kind of just like, kind of do this thing like this as he would drive past in the car. Then, I mean, clearly he let me know that he's looking right at me. You clearly see that he was singling me out. The thing that made me feel uncomfortable is that King would get my number from someone that was from my neighborhood by calling me, blowing up my phone, you know, kind of like being a little bit aggressive. Just kind of demanding to meet him. After all that pressure, you know, I kind of just said, well, let me see what the hell this guy wants. I contacted him. I asked him, you know, why is he borrowing me? What do you want? And he says to me, you know, that he just wants to talk. King tells him to come and meet him in the parking lot of this right aid. 
And so Davon then, he's he's nervous, he's worried, because he's got to go and meet with this cop who's probably going to ask him to become an informant. I just remember just being really nervous, you know, like, because I knew number one cold, you know, that if, you know, snitching went and here in Baltimore, it's a death sentence. So I make death sentence, you know, so... I mean, I'm not gonna help them at all. It's a million things going through my mind that, you know, if someone sees me, I'm gonna get my head blown off, you know, when I when I leave, you know, if you know I can ruin my reputation. So I made sure I sat directly behind him. I just kind of gave him this look, you know, to let him know I wasn't shitting around at all. You know, it's kind of like a dead silence, you know, for a few minutes. And I think at this point I'm really starting to, you know, starting to feel myself and starting to get a little bit, you know. Um, anxious. He gets to talking and he started to tell me that he had been watching me for a while and um, he really liked the way I did business. Like I'm like dude what business I don't know business you're talking about. Like he finally just gets to the climax and he's like if you work with me any drugs that he sees period you know wherever it came from raid or streets they were going to be for sale. You know if you can do something with it it's yours. You know, at that point, you know, I realized that if this is real, he was just a drug dealer with a badge. In the summer of 2004, Davon Mayer was terrified, and not because of rival drug kingpins coming after him. It was a narcotics officer at the Baltimore PD named William King who had him running scared. First time I meet King, I tell him I meet him like 12 o'clock in the park a lot. He started to tell me that he really liked the way I did business. And he's like, maybe I'll go on a house raid and, you know, let's just say I find two bricks of drugs. And he's like, maybe I tell him I found one. And when he told me that, it was like, holy shit. This is, you know, that this is illegal, you know, that he's pretty much a drug dealer. About three days later, we meet again, and I get in the back in the same position I do, sit behind him. As soon as I get in there, he just throws a pack of drugs on the back seat. It's like, you know what you think? You know, and when I looked at it, I knew exactly what it came from. Davon realized that this was a double-edged sword. He knew that even though this was a great opportunity for him, he was still going to be bringing harm to his fellow drug dealers. But he was very strategic in his thinking that this could be, you know, the easiest way to make money. I think I told him, you know, I can give him like 350 cash, you know, right there at the moment for him. And um, he lit up like a Christmas tree. He was beyond happy. From there, I made a lot of small deals. You know, I would give them like 500 for it. I would buy it at like 50% of what it was worth on the street. And, you know, I would keep that profit for myself and just pay him straight out, which was no problem for him because obviously it was free for him. And it was like, we're on the same page. At that point, I just kind of looked at him as an equal, like a criminal, like me. It was just about making money. He kind of showed his hand. You know, I could kind of see that he obviously was in some position where he wanted money. William King liked to go to the club. He liked to spend money on women. He had bought this Denali, this, this big SUV. He had divorced his wife, and so he had financial obligations that he wasn't able to meet. He only made a police officer's salary, which is what prompted him to go down this road. I don't know if it actually came into play in this particular situation, but what I can say is um, for the work that police officers actually do, especially in Baltimore City compared to our uh, surrounding jurisdictions, we get paid a lot less. To make ends meet, some cops work side gigs like private security. But William King found a way to rake it in without lifting a finger by arresting dealers and stealing their drugs then asking them to sell it back on the street and taking a share of the profits. It was such easy money, King decided to share the wealth with his partner, Antonio Murray. One day, um, Detective 
King calls me and um, he says, hey, look, we need to meet somewhere different. You know, this is something more important. I told him, you know, that we can meet at a McDonald's you know, that I knew of. And um, when I pull up, um, I get in the car and it's not just the tech king, it's tech king and tech king. You know, so I was already drawn back because I didn't really like, you know, um, the tech body too much at all. You know, the bravado, the way he carried himself, I didn't like it at all. Tech King began to tell me that um, he had a, a bunch of marijuana, you know, a bunch of weed that he wanted to sell, and it was, you know, could I handle tens of thousands of dollars worth of marijuana? So I told him um, at first that I was only going to be able to bring so much of the money and I would have to owe him. The next day, I met them and um, pulled the money I had to hold it in like two hands. It was like Mary just like fell in love. He, you know, it was like, hey, man, you know, you the man and you know, man, you the king of the streets. For him to be so fake and phony and shit like that, just over some money, just clearly tells me that that's all he cares about, really. So from then, you know, he was like a solid partner. Will and Antonio were a good team together that they would make a lot of arrests. They were bringing in numbers. But, you know, when people produce, they're not going to dig into how you produce. And if you bring in numbers, nobody's going to be really looking at you. No, um, he he never mentioned to me anything about someone doing anything that was illegal. Murray kept his shady dealings a secret from his closest friends and allies. But like his partner, King, Murray shared an obsession with pocketing drug money. And the greedier they got, the bolder their crimes became. You know, from that moment, it was just a repetitive process over and over again. He would, he would kind of line them up, I'd knock them down. This is mostly cocaine at first. I would probably think that we would probably be like, maybe a couple times a week. And then it kind of graduated to more so just heroin. At that time, when we started moving to heroin, I would definitely say you know, I was making north of five to seven grand a week easy. Davon's relationship with King and Murray was blossoming into a full-blown business partnership. It was a mutually beneficial arrangement that worked for all three of them, at least for a while. Detective King started to notice that it um, was doing really well for myself. But the thing is, sometimes I would give him holding like 25% of what the drugs were. So I was making astronomical profits at this point. I was driving nicer cars. I was looking extremely nice. He would start to say little things, you know, like some somebody's looking good today. Oh, uh, you look like money, little things like that. I started realizing yeah, he was counting my money. You know, he was he was trying to figure out how much I was taking in and why I was taking in so much and his taking was so little. And um, that's when Detective King put major pressure on me. You know, after a while, I would kind of feel like he wasn't asking me about helping him get the drugs anymore. He was kind of demanding it. Detective King asked me to start assisting him in finding the drugs. I would always insist that you know, I'll buy the stuff from you, but I wasn't willing to cooperate with him and help him find out about dealers and what they were doing because it would have not only endangered myself, you know, endangered my family. What I told him, I would never ever help him. At this point, Davon realized that if others found out, that it would be game over for him. I could, I could really feel the tension. I could feel it. Them setting me up were killing me. And then I fall 2004, you know, King and Mark take me to the police station. They give me every threat that they can. I go to jail and basically I'm replaceable. They were insisting that I tell them where stashes were, where they can get abundance of drugs and abundance of money and guns and basically replenish their wealth, you know? And it was like, you don't really have a choice at this point. After they gave me an ultimatum and told me, you know, go about my way, it was war for me right there telling my friends or, or go to jail. I'd rather be in jail than 
you know, being labeled as a snitch, I knew it was time for me to escalate things to the next level. That's when I got the magic thought that maybe I should call the FBI. By the fall of 2004, Baltimore detectives King and Murray were ready to move their drug dealing operation to the next level. After pressuring 16-year-old Davon Mayer to sell drugs on their behalf for almost six months, the two cops demanded that he rat out other Baltimore dealers so they could access an even larger supply. It was a dangerous proposition that left Davon with little choice than to go to extremes. After they gave me an ultimatum, I knew it was time for me to escalate things to the next level. I should even go big or go home. And um, I said, well, maybe I should call the FBI. I called. But I pretty much was scared shitless and hung up. Because somewhere deep inside of me, I felt like I was snitching. <laughs> In Baltimore in the early 2000s, distrust of the local police had become so deep and widespread that an intense anti-snitching culture had developed in town. And in the eyes of many, snitches weren't just people who gave up a criminal to the cops. They could be anybody who provided even basic information about a crime. Even the extended community didn't view informants too kindly. In order to drive home this point that it was terrible, to snitch. There was a DVD that was made. It became very popular within Baltimore. It was called Stop Snitching. One day, um, when it was getting closer to the time for my daughter to be born, and it got to a point where I realized that I wanted to be a good father and be there to raise my child. I called the FBI. I remember, you know, being like incredibly nervous and um, I explained to a guy, I, I literally told him everything. I couldn't see the guy because of the phone, but I could feel his face and then he just said, holy shit. He asked me if I feel safe and I told him no. He told me that he would get someone to contact me, you know, ASAP. Three days later, Agent Wolf calls me and tells me that him and Agent Munoz want to meet with me. I told him a location to meet me at. I remember being incredibly, incredibly nervous. Like, I mean, literally shitting on myself as I'm walking. I automatically thought, you know, if um, King sees me, I'm dead. And at this point, I'm just really in a rock and a hard place. You know, it's like, I just kind of felt like I was really in over my head at that point. I'm risking everything, but to live a happier life, I decided to go through with it and I got in the car. That's when I meet. Agent Wolf and Agent Munoz. Davon uh, reached out to the FBI in November of 2004, and we met him down in Baltimore City. And when I first met Davon, he was very credible. I think that we we knew we had something something going on there. I think when Davon came in, we realized pretty quickly that even though he was young, Davon was pretty savvy, and he realized there was a big imbalance of power in his relationship with King and Murray, and that they held all the power, that they could arrest him at any time, and he realized he was in a bad situation. He had also just had a daughter, and I think he wanted to get out of the situation he was in and make some really positive changes in his life and get out of drug dealing. We talked with Dave on with exactly how they were doing the illegal activity, uh, him and King and Murray. The first thing we decided to do was to uh, have a consensual monitored phone call between Davon and William King, which we conducted. I mean, I knew I could easily, you know, I could pick up the phone and say some illegal stuff some legal shit to King, and he's gonna talk, you know, right there. He wasn't literally about talking on the phones. So um, I pick up my phone. I tell him that soon I may be able to figure out something where maybe some stashes, or I might know where some drugs coming up as soon, and um, maybe I might be able to help him out. In those exact words, I let him know all those things, and um, he says, oh, whenever you're ready, 
I will be there. He pretty much incriminates himself right in front of him on the phone. That was kind of like the golden egg. You know, once that conversation was over, they grieved a, a sigh of excitement. Mine's more like a sigh of relief. I got somebody on my side that I, that can help me with this. I don't have any parents or nobody I can turn to and tell them to help me. So it's like, at that time, it was like, you know, finally, I got some help. And um, that's where it began, right there. And there was definitely a lot of urgency. We were investigating two armed police officers who were victimizing people on a daily basis. So we needed to uncover the full extent of it, but we also needed to do it pretty quickly to get them off the street. In the fall of 2004, drug dealer Davon Mayer met with FBI agents Richard Wolf and Wendy Munoz. After hearing about Davon's dealings with corrupt cops King and Murray, the FBI realized they would need wiretaps to seal the case. But with King and Murray victimizing people every day, they knew the clock was ticking. We started doing surveillance. We set up a camera so we could see the parking lot where King and Murray worked. And we started looking at telephone records, toll records for both of the officers just to corroborate what Davon was saying and put it all into one affidavit. And that's how we were able initially to establish probable cause to go up on King and Murray's Baltimore issued phone and the personal phone. We also soon realized that just having wiretaps on their phones wasn't enough. We really needed to get wiretaps in the car that they were driving. When they went into their vehicle, they were no longer on their telephone. So we made the decision to obtain their vehicle and placing microphones in their vehicle. We contacted Chevrolet and got a key to their vehicle and found a lookalike or a decoy vehicle that was the same make, model, and year as the vehicle they drove. We had surveillance on both King and Murray to make sure that they weren't going to come to the office. We had one agent get in the car, pull it out. We pulled in our decoy vehicle. We left two people in the area just to kind of keep an eye on our decoy vehicle in case somebody saw something. The tech agents did the install, and then we went back, we pulled out the decoy vehicle, and just pulled the car back into the same spot. So now that recording is underway, the first thing that the case agents want Davon to do is conduct a full transaction with King and Murray under their supervision to see if King and Murray are actually dealing in drugs. If wiretaps and recorded calls could show King and Murray picking up a drug stash and completing a financial transaction for drugs, the FBI would have a tremendous piece of evidence for the case. No longer would it be just the testimony of a 16-year-old drug dealer against King and Murray. Now, they would have the two officers' recorded voices and actions to use against them in court. We have really strict rules surrounding any kind of drug transaction. We had considered using real drugs because obviously we want to keep Davon safe. We don't want there to be any chance that somehow King or Murray discover that you know, we're using fake narcotics. But we couldn't figure out any way to completely control the scenario because we can never let drugs walk or even have a chance that drugs could end up out on the street. Our only option was to use fake narcotics. So I devised a plan where I told Rich that we should make thousands beyond thousands of dollars of packets of fake drugs. We manufacture our own uh, crack, and we placed that into the little baggies that crack is frequently sold in. I think we destroyed the microwave in our break room trying to make these this fake crack. It looked horrible. We're having fun at this point. I put on my thinking cap, and um, I was pretty much a scientist with drugs. So I knew that crack very, very, very closely resembles macadamia nuts. The macadamia nuts were kind of waxy and had the same color as crack. We tried that, and we showed it to Davon, and he said it looked good. Three days later, they gave me the fake drugs and the McDonald's bag that, you know, we had came up with. 
And I found a good spot, and I stashed him in the alley. After that, I, I walked back to the FBI vehicle, and um, I put the phone on speaker, and I called King and Murray, and I told him that I had saw, you know, someone put a bag of drugs, you know, down in the alley. He tells me he's on his way with lightning speed. We felt like we needed to show King and Murray taking the dealer's stash of drugs. So what we decided to do is to have Davon tell them where the drug dealer's stash was located, and we would capture the phone call. As I'm on the phone, he's literally in the next block down, and I'm telling him to go through the alley, to go five yards down, look under a brush, and then he says to me, I got it. How soon can you meet me? And I tell him that I'm going to meet him, you know, at his job. Walking over there, I remember being nervous as hell. You know, I walk up to the car and I get in there. He just kind of gives me a look. He's like, everything gonna be good? And I'm like, you know, it's all good. I tell him, man, it hasn't always been good. And then within 20 minutes, I get the package back. And I tell him I was gonna give him like $3,500 for return. And um, he's through the roof. Two weeks go by, I meet Agent Wolf. We make the call and King's ready. He's ready, like, hey, oh, you got the money today. Like, he's like lottery. This is like lottery day. And then when I meet King, this time I don't have any nervousness or anything. I just pass $3,500 over to him. And he looks, I mean, the look he gave me, I would have thought they was about to kiss me. And I had a device recording, you know, everything. And then um, we sealed the deal. At this point, a gold mine of evidence starts to come in. And that's when the FBI discovers that Davon isn't their only rodeo. In early 2005, the FBI was keeping an ear on everything going on inside King and Murray's car when shocking new evidence started to come in. The two cops divided up drugs and money in the car every day and discussed who they would target next. And then in February 2005, the recordings revealed an absolute bombshell. Davon wasn't the only dealer working with King and Murray. We became aware that they were utilizing another individual in pursuing their criminal activity. His name is Antonio Mosby. And we not only had the, the telephone interceptions where we heard what Mosby was doing, but when they got back in the car, we heard the entire discussion about what Mosby did, what he saw, and what the officers did uh, about that. So our investigation uh, not only proved that Antonio Mosby was obtaining uh, drugs and or money from drug dealers, spotting, if you would, for King and Murray, as a result of that, King and Murray would also approach those individual drug dealers and try to incorporate them into a very similar activity, providing information involving drugs and money. At that point, the FBI learns that these two cops are doing this on a large scale. There were several other uh, drug dealers involved with, uh, with what they were doing as a result of uh, Antonio Mosby helping them out. We hear King and Murray's own words that, you know, the kind of activity that they were engaging in. They would utilize their status as police officers to detain these people, put them in handcuffs, put them in the car. Uh, they would take their drugs and their money. They would find them and, you know, tell them if you don't start contacting me every day, that they would arrest them. But they held all the power. They were victimizing people out on the streets of Baltimore pretty much every day. The FBI learned that King and Murray were threatening victims with violence, even putting a gun to the head of a dealer. But despite their glaring misbehavior, the two cops had managed to escape the radar of their superiors at the Baltimore PD, which meant the pressure for agents Wolf and Munoz to bring them to justice grew more urgent by the day. Police officers were hired to protect the public and to arrest and investigate these drug dealers. If they become corrupt, then the whole system becomes corrupt. And I certainly would think that uh, police corruption is, is a much more uh, heinous crime than, than drug dealing. They can hear King and Murray threatening other drug dealers 
grabbing drug dealers off the street, throwing them into the back of the car, taking their money, letting them go without filing charges. You can hear people on the sidewalk sort of cowering and resisting at this obvious abuse of authority. And this is sort of the clinching evidence that the FBI needs in order to move to the next phase. We decided to uh, approach Antonio Mosby. We asked him to come into the car with us and, and have a chat. He was, he was nervous when we approached him, but he was cooperative. The FBI now had Mosby on their side, which meant that not just Davon, but Mosby was going to testify about the conduct of these cops. It was clear that they had enough evidence to take these two cops to court. Now all that remained was to arrest them. There is an ethical part of, of doing any criminal investigation where you feel you've gathered enough evidence. And after we uh, utilized uh, Antonio Mosby, we just realized it was, it was kind of just time to take the case down. A lot of planning went into the arrest. Anytime that you're arresting police officers, you know they're armed and you know they're trained in police tactics. So you have to have plans in place to minimize the risk to them and to the other officers involved. We came up with a ruse that uh, our agency was going to partner with the Baltimore City Police in conducting very specific uh, investigations throughout the city. We specifically asked for their unit because they were playing clothes and experienced drug agents, uh, drug officers to help us out with that uh, particular plan. And we asked them to come to our office for a meeting. And we were saying, hey, we don't really allow guns in the building. Uh, and then when they came in, it, it included all of uh, their squads. So we didn't want it to single out King and Murray because we felt that they would have probably caught on to something was, you know, something was up here. So. Uh, we separated them out with a couple agents, and uh, at that point, we explained to the uh, innocent parties that what we were doing, and then we just arrested, we simply arrested King and Murray at the time. But we specifically told them that we're not asking you anything. We just want you to listen to this. And we played a couple of the interceptions that we had that were very, very damning. I think they were shocked. King was pretty quiet. Murray definitely wasn't going to talk to us at that point. Uh, but he did make some statements about shaming the department and his family. William King and Antonio Murray. As Baltimore police officers, they misused their police power to benefit themselves. This man, drug dealer, told us of being robbed by King after he threatened arrest. I was actually sitting at my, at my desk, and I got a call from a police officer asking me that I just hear the news. He said, Will and Antonio had got arrested. The news just started flying around the whole police department. Over the course of a couple of days, we found out the full ramifications of what was going on. I never thought Antonio was capable of uh, anything like this. In 2005, the FBI arrested King and Murray, setting off a media firestorm that shined a spotlight on police corruption in Baltimore. The case was a staggering abuse of power, where two officers used their badges, authority, and police vehicles to circulate large quantities of drugs all over the city. The indictment alleges that King and Murray conspired to obtain cocaine, cocaine base, heroin, and marijuana and proceeds from the sale of such narcotics by robbery and extortion. Now, it was up to federal prosecutors to use their unprecedented audio evidence to secure justice for the people of Baltimore and put bad actors on notice in departments across the nation. My client, Antonio Murray, was really looking at a life sentence. Speaking with the government, we had the offer to work out a plea and I said to him, I think you have an opportunity to avail yourself of minimizing what you're exposed to. My biggest obstacle in representing Antonio Murray was his unshakable belief with the influence that William King had over him. He said, nah, King said, we're going to be OK. He got me. My, my partner's going to have my back. Davon realized that these two arrests had gone down 
and he was immediately a little nervous because now word was going to spread that that he had been working with the FBI. News about the case rocked the Baltimore PD, and rumors began to spread in the local community that many dealers had been snitching to King and Murray. The stop snitching video resurfaced, and this time the lyrics raised alarm bells for investigators. We had heard that King and Murray's names were mentioned on that video. We were concerned about Davon. At that point, Davon had to move out of his neighborhood. The FBI kept him in a safe location, and he stayed there for several weeks until the trial began. My girlfriend I've been with for years, she just called me like, hey, um, you know, um, I saw that you went to court today. She was like, yeah, my sister just called me. You know, everybody in the whole city he was saying that you the one that put uh, detectives in jail. There was a crowd of people outside the court, including some of his associates and drug dealers, and some of them were extremely angry because he was now working with the FBI. When Davon took the stand, he was definitely nervous and shaky, but all of the evidence was clear. He was able to walk through his own involvement. Testifying against King was the worst thing I ever done. It devastated me. But they played an unfair game because you can't be a criminal with a badge. I did what I had to do. Davon is definitely the hero of the story. He's definitely the good guy. A young kid who's grown up in a neighborhood where violence and drug crimes were routine. For that kid to find the gumption and the maturity to decide to turn in these two crooked cops is nothing short of heroic. I consider Davon and Mayor to have done the right thing, and the prosecutors did a great job as well. We played those calls and, and interceptions to the jury as they read along with the transcripts. It was particularly damning to the officers to listen to them actually doing criminal activity. A jury found ex-Baltimore police detectives Antonio Murray and William King guilty of robbing drug dealers, selling the goods, and keeping the cash. The sentences for Antonio Murray was 130 years. Will King got upwards to about 300 years. Man, I worked in a homicide unit, and see guys who commit murder and don't get that much time. I think that was uh, excessive. There's a really high price for corruption that I think people don't always think about. King and Murray were essentially drug dealers, but the difference is that they were in a position of power. They swore to protect the city of Baltimore and the citizens of Baltimore, and they were using their power to line their own pockets. In the years since King and Murray's convictions, corruption and police abuse has reared its ugly head multiple times in Baltimore resulting in further convictions and scandal for the Baltimore PD. In 2021, King and Murray had their sentences reduced to 20 years each, based on new federal sentencing guidelines. After the trial, I enrolled into a college. Around about 2014, I started my own business. I knew I could fix computers. I was really good with computers. I invested everything, a thousand percent into it. And here we are. I don't have to break a law, you know, to pay all my bills. I don't have to break one law. And it's like, I, I don't think I even realized this level of happiness existed. 